Chris, you see Welcome to Dental Notches TV, right? Yes, Welcome to Dental Notches TV. All right, cool. Imagine making a $30,000 mistake when buying a dental practice. Imagine not knowing what questions to ask or how to build a team when making the most important decision of your dental life. My name is Dr. Paul Goodman, Dr. Nacho, and I don't have to imagine that because I made those mistakes in 2011. I didn't know what questions to ask when buying a dental practice. I didn't know working with a dual representation broker is Nacho Nuts. A dual representation broker claims to be able to represent your interest and the interest of the selling dentist at the same time. So if you only listen to this much, just know that working with a dual representation broker can burn your nachos in making the most important decision of your dental life. My goal as Dr. Paul Goodman, Dr. Nacho, is to help you with the four most important decisions you will make in your entire dentisting career, or what I call the circle of dentisting life. Finding your first job, buying your first practice, hiring your first associate, and selling your only practice. Dental school teaches us a lot about the Krebs cycle and how to make a mediocre bite rim, but not enough about our dentisting core. What is our dentisting core? The decisions we make with our mind, the words we say, which are ultra important, our clinical skills, and at the center of it all, our heart, who we look to help, and the impact we look to make. Making mistakes in the four biggest decisions of your dentisting career can cause so many problems. And I wanna give you actionable takeaways in each one of those steps. So let's talk about finding your first job. What is some common mistake dentists make is starting too late. Finding your first job should start day one of D1, not applying for that job, finding it. ABC, always be connecting. Meeting people in industry who can help. Who are these people if you're a dental st student? Who should you reach out to? Go to in-person C events. Sit next to dentists that look older than you and meet them. They may not be looking for an associate, but they may have a friend who's also looking. When you go to sign an associate contract, do not sign one without having a dental-focused attorney review it. As Dr. Nacho, founder of a 30,000-member plus Facebook group, I get poignant messages daily from dental associates who did not have anyone review their contract and now they have a problem. Problem getting paid, problem with their restrictive covenant. So get a dental-focused attorney to review your contract. Nothing bad happens. Either the dental-focused attorney says, hey, this contract looks pretty good, let's ask for a few things here, but if we don't get these things, it's still a good contract. Or they say, there's 14 red flags and I haven't gotten to page two of that contract. So that's finding your first job. Buying your first practice. The mistake I made with, was with us buying a second practice. Hey everyone, this is Paul Dr. Nacho. Welcome to Faster, More Efficient, Better Crown Preps with my good friend, Dr. Lincoln Harris. I'm gonna stop my screen in just a second, but if you are watching in live and you would like live CE for free, favorite price of dentisting humans, I know I am one, text register to 215-543-6454. There'll be a code at the end of the show that you would enter to get live CE for watching in from your couch, check your state regulations. We use CE Zoom, they're an awesome partner. So uh, if you right now, text register to 215-543-6454. I'm gonna stop my share and bring up Link, let him start his video. Dr. Lincoln Harris is coming from the future in Australia. It's the next day. What time is it there, Link? It is 8.30 in the morning. Well, 8.30 in the morning. Well, it's 6.30. We're winding down, wind down time, uh, pun intended here in the U.S. So we're so glad to have you. I'm thrilled to present this to the Nacho audience. Um, before we get into the C, I want to ask you a question. Why do you feel the need or why does this benefit the dental community to focus on this fundamental procedure, faster, better crown preps? What's your What was your motivation for this topic? Uh, Paul, the issues with being trained as a dentist are the same in almost every country, <clears throat> which is that dentistry is a surgical specialty, but every other surgical specialty 
is well trained when they graduate and we are not. So most people graduate having done less than 10 repetitions. I know there's exceptions, but most people have graduated having done less than 10 repetitions of crowns. And then on top of that, they're made to feel guilty if they do one, you know, as if you're doing crown preps is evil, um, touching teeth is evil. And if you don't solve all problems with preventive care and so on, then you're a bad dentist. So this is like, it, it's almost, you know, incompetence on the part of people who train us. And it, it upsets yeah. me. It's upset me enough to start a company that's based around. I think that's it. awesome. And I want to, we're going to talk about, it. you can share your screen whenever you would like a uh, link. But I am Dr. Nacho, head of a 40,000 member Facebook group. But uh, my good friend, Lincoln Harris, who came to the US to see me, he's going to one up me. Not everybody is a member of your Facebook group. You want to check it out if you are. Link, at the current time, how many people are in your Facebook group? Uh, I think we have about 85,000. Hang on, I'm just fixing my sure, screen. Sure, yeah, no problem. They have 85,000 um, uh, restorative protocol Facebook group. Uh, Christian, my awesome team member, can look to put that in the chat. So before we start the C, I want to interview Link, or I want him to share with us, he talked about solving this challenge of dentist, parentheses new, it could be any dentist, but parentheses new, with his educational program. Tell us about it, Link. Um, Paul, I've been teaching since 2006 with various conferences and so on. And what I've learned is that the way that we're taught at dental school is not only lax in repetition, it's actually just really bad. It's a bad way to teach. And if we did the same type of education for pilots, no one would want to fly. Yeah. Like you imagine you hop into the plane and they go, oh yes, the pilot has read every paper on <laughs> flying and he's done six landings. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's no way that you would do this. So, so my background actually was aviation because I was a pilot when I was at high school. And so looking at the way they're trained, they're trained with a thing called human factors, which is how humans actually learn skills under stress. And it's bugged me so much that I started a company, a, a new company focused entirely on how do you make education more effective at lower cost that's accessible everywhere. And so that was Right Global. And we started Right Global uh, with... We've got investors all around the world. We've uh, raised nearly $4 million from investors to start this company, to build the platform and to build our simulation kit that we ship. So we have students in 12 countries, including a whole lot in the United States uh, <clears throat> that all connect. And the way that our simulation kits work and the way that our education works, it gives you the ability to transition from say a new graduate to doing full mouth rehabilitations for about 75% less cost than if you go to a big That's institute. Right. I tell my wife, Link, that I don't inter interrupt. I just interject with good ideas. So I want to interject. As I see your crown prep boot camp, is this something you can take anywhere in the U.S.? I'm someone and we're about the same age. So I'm thinking I've taught hands-on courses, but you walk around the table, you look over someone's shoulder, they're drilling straight with an implant drill or not. That's been me. I'm really impressed by what you've done. But just so it's clear to our audience, explain how this works and how you can be in a totally different country mm. learning hands-on. Well, you can't just attend from the United States. You can attend from anywhere on earth that you have compressed air and that you have electricity. <clears throat> That's all you need. So you can come from Antarctica if you want to. Um, we ship a simulation kit to you. We connect you to our platform. And then we have developed a process for running cloud distributed hands-on, which not only reduces the cost by, it's about 70% over flying to a, a a facility, but it's better. The students learn 50 to 70% faster when we teach them like this. It's actually technically a better way to learn because the way that we teach you is more visual and you will understand the problems faster. So uh, we actually only have about six places left for the next one in the United States. We'll uh, share in the link how people can <clears throat> get this link. I know I'm sure the link link joke has never been said to you before, but I'll just, I, I'm gonna mine it as long as I can. Um, they will share links, links, but I want to point this out too, uh, Link. I'm not someone who can cook anything. My wife can, but I assume that these dentists doing this in their operatories, it's a it's a comfortable way for them to learn. I mean, they're 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 in their own space learning from you guys uh, via Zoom. Is that is that accurate? Well, we don't use Zoom, but we um, uh, and it, it's not just like a webinar. It, it's a full. Uh, process that we have developed. And we're still the only people in the world who do this. Uh, <clears throat> the thing about it is not so much that it's more comfortable, it's just better. 
because yeah. we don't insist that you use a particular diamond burr, a particular handpiece, particular material. Uh, we aren't interested in the material you use unless your material is terrible, but we are interested in the skill and the development of your skill with the equipment that you have, because if you use your own chair for training, you can apply it immediately. Love that. That's a, it's, it's, it's such a valuable way. I'm so impressed. Now, as you roll along through this, I know you and I are young at heart and we're very, very funny and handsome medium age dentist but we may not look exactly like your core demographic of the newer dentist. Do you have anyone that you could share that's taken this and some feedback they could give our audience? I mean, I've got lots of people, but the funny thing is that a lot of the people I teach are new grads, but some of them are actually 20 year veterans who just basically haven't put any effort in, but I'll just give you a little bit of a taste of what some people are saying. So Rife Global is actually a community of talented dentists all around the world that help each other grow. This is hands-on education from home. Everybody can benefit from this. It's not just one instructor, it's not just two, it's an entire team. This is the world's largest geographical but smallest tight-knit community study club I've ever seen. So <clears throat> thanks for uh, allowing me to talk I a little bit. About I just want to share, you know, as someone who's been involved in education for since 2005 myself, this is what our community needs. Whether mm -hmm. you think your dental school experience left you high and dry, didn't deliver what it should, you've created a way for people to invest a reasonable amount of money. We'll share this link in the chat. Um, we'll turn the presentation over for the C link, but at the end, we will talk more a little bit more about mm -hmm. this and see, take some questions from the audience on it. No problem, Paul. Thank you very much. And so awesome. thank you for, for those of you who have joined. Thank you very much. And I love questions. Uh, if Paul doesn't get too tired, I will answer questions until everyone is finished. Uh, obviously, it's 6.30 there. So having a margarita there is perfectly acceptable and may even improve the quality of my lecture a little bit. Um, obviously, I can't have a margarita because uh, it's eight in the morning and that's generally poorly viewed even in Australia. So. Uh, <clears throat> The key thing I want to talk about with crown preps is that a lot of the time we focus too much on the wrong things. So in dentistry, we are very technique focused. We are focused on which technique do you use? I use such and such technique. And sometimes the techniques are named after people. And sometimes they even have a whole religion, a dental religion built around them. So you have like people who use my technique and people who are evil. But that's actually not the thing that makes you a great dentist. So, you know, you think about aerobatics, flying an aerobatic plane, a person who is a Red Bull pilot will eventually find flying an aerobatic plane easy. Does that mean that it's easy? No, it's not an easy thing to do at all. It's very difficult. So why do they think it's easy? So that is the question we're going to focus on today is, a lot of what makes something easy has nothing to do with the technique. And today I'm going to talk about three things, three Ds uh, for fast, easy, precise crown preps. Okay, so those are, we're going to drill, we're going to work on distractions, and we're going to make dentistry dull again. Okay, making dentistry dull is one of the most important things that you can do. And when I talk about drill, I'm not talking about uh, a handpiece, I'm talking about drilling as in repetitive practice that's as realistic as possible until something becomes automatic. Now, for a long time, I didn't realize why they do a lot of things that they do in the military, such as polish boots, make beds, polish the buttons on their tunics and uh, practice over and over and over again to clean their rifles and reassemble them. Now, the reason they do those things is to teach attention to detail and to make things automatic. And so this is actually what they call close quarters combat training here, which is where you have to break into a room and only uh, shoot the bad guys and not the good guys, and it has to be done so fast under chaotic conditions. And the reason that you have to drill this over and over again is in real life, it is a very stressful thing to do. 
And dentistry is mostly a very stressful thing to do as well. And so that means that if we don't practice a procedure until it's completely mindless, then when we get a patient with a massive tongue who gags and complains, and the first thing they say is, I hate you, and so on and so forth, then you can't do the procedure under that stress. <clears throat> now, it is important to understand that perfection is not excellence. In fact, perfection is the enemy of excellence. And unfortunately, a lot of the way that we are trained is to focus on perfection, not on excellence. And let me give you an example of this. Most people, when they do their first crown prep at dental school, uh, will take four hours. They'll have a big three or four hour session. Uh, <clears throat> and what will happen is that the, you'll be shown to cut the top off the tooth and then you will do the next step and step and step and step. And so you, if you get anything wrong, you'll be graded poorly, but you will do one. Now, the best example of this would be learning the piano. Imagine you go to learn the piano. First of all, you don't have a piano at home. You only have one at the piano lab, okay? And the, you're not allowed to make a mistake. Otherwise, you're going to lose uh, you're going to lose marks. And so you have three hours to play a three minute song. And so to make sure that you don't make any mistakes, you very carefully look at the music, measure where the key is, and then you get your finger and you go dong on one key. And then you measure the next note on the music and then you whack the next key. Now you will make zero mistakes doing this. Even a beginner could do this and not make one single mistake. But how much has it taught you about playing the piano? Nothing. It's actually taught you nothing at all. And in dentistry, we do this at a sim lab and then we go and treat a patient. So that's like you've done this three hour playing of a single song on your piano by donging each key uh, separately over an extended period. And then you go and do a concert. It's ridiculous. So. <clears throat> The first thing for making your crown preps uh, fast, easy, and precise is you have to practice. I don't mean on your patients. You need to practice in a place where you can destroy teeth over and over and over again. And it's that repetition. So that's why uh, the problem is that dental school trains you like this and almost every course in the world follows the same path, which is the path of trying to achieve perfection by doing something extremely slowly, step by step. You know, it's very common for a course <clears throat> to take an entire day to do a, a layered composite. You get a lecture and then they do the first bit, and you do the first bit and so on. So part of the reason that I've built courses where you do 17 crown preps back to back is to drill the student, so to, to train them so it becomes automatic. Okay, but... but it's also good to practice on your own. So part of it is if you want to learn the piano well, you have to have your own piano. So that's number one. Number two is distraction. With anything that we do, we have what we call mental capacity. Mental capacity is used massively in aviation uh, and in other areas where it's known that the stress of what you do affects your ability to perform that procedure. So in dentistry, we have a whole range of distractions. And if your distractions start mounting up too much, you actually cannot function. So I'll give you an example. It's actually not that difficult to fly even a big plane once it's flying. So if you were put in the cockpit of this plane while it's flying along, most people on this call could probably steer the plane straight ahead uh, or turn a little bit or go up and down. The difficulty then is uh, if you had to land a plane, then it becomes more complex because you're doing a much more difficult procedure. Uh, but on top of that, you can start to layer stress. So imagine that not only are you flying, but you are in a thunderstorm. And so it's really rough. Now, Flying doesn't really worry me at all, but I do know that when I get in really heavy turbulence, even in a big plane, it's stressful. Now, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, uh, the plane is stronger than you, basically. So uh, it is not dangerous to be in turbulence until 
uh, the people in the plane are getting severely injured. So when people are flying around the cabin, getting all their bones broken, that's when it starts to get dangerous for the plane. And none of us have ever been in turbulence like that. So like, you know, the it is unbelievably, planes are unbelievably strong, but even though we're well outside that capability, we start to get stress. So imagine now you're flying the plane, you have turbulence, so now you have a layer of stress, and now the engine is on fire. Now you have two layers of stress. <clears throat> the ability for you to make good decisions and for you to be able to function and do really fine work is now uh, reducing a lot. And there's actually a lot of research around this, uh, which is that as we stress people, their performance improves up until a certain point. And then once you go past that point, you start to suffer from poor judgment, uh, poor decision-making, and then you get breakdown. And so, uh, a bit of stress is good, but too much uh, will kill your ability to perform. So when we come to crown preps, there's several things that you need to fix before you even worry about the prep itself. The first one is uh, you need to encourage a, a policy in your office where people don't come and ask you questions in the middle of procedures. So someone asking you a question about a patient or about someone who's running late or whatever in the middle of a procedure will significantly uh, reduce your ability to make decisions. Second, obviously making sure that the room is set up properly. Thirdly, if you have anxious patients, drug them somehow. So get IV sedation, get uh, oral conscious sedation, get anxiolysis, get nitrous oxide, whatever you can do in your area. But the more you reduce anxiety of your uh, patients, the more mental capacity you have left to do the prep itself. Now, the interesting thing is that experienced dentists know this. And so the more experienced a dentist gets, the more they tend to put effort into managing anxiety with drugs. And when you were, we're new graduates, we don't really know how to organize this. And so as new graduates, we tend to do this less, even though we need it more. So uh, this is just going to be a general trend through careers is that as we go through careers, <clears throat> we tend to uh, focus more and more and more on reducing all of these distractions around us. Obviously, one of the key parts of crown preps is having profound and massive local anaesthetic. So don't cheap out on anaesthetic. I always use a lot. If I'm doing a lower jaw, I'm going to do a buccal infiltration. I'm going to do a nerve block. I'm going to do a lingual infiltration. Most of the time I will do uh, maybe a interpapillary injection as well <clears throat> because I don't want any chance of the patient feeling pain in the middle because it is one of the biggest distractions that you can possibly get. Uh, I'll show you my kit keeping your kit simple. So some people have like 900 different burrs that they choose from. Then you get decision anxiety. And so all these things use up uh, mental capacity. And then I will talk today about tissue. Managing tissues is probably the most difficult part of doing crown preps. And it's the area where we want to put, uh, have a really, really boring system that works really well. So <clears throat> that's the preamble, which is we need to make, if we're going to do a great job, we want to drill. Uh, we want to remove distractions. And now I'm going to talk about how we make crown preps dull. Now, I don't mean dull, you know, it's boring. I just mean that you just turn it into a mindless routine that you follow day after day, and it's always the same. Now, just while we're talking about kit, this is my kit that I use for everything, except there's one type of crown prep that I use a few different burrs for, and there is another burr that I use for veneers. So this burr kit I use for all of the direct fillings, all the indirect fillings, all the crowns, uh, anterior composites, everything. I have <clears throat> three other burrs that I use for two very special procedures. One is vertical crown preps and the other one is a depth cutting wheel that I use for veneers. Now, why do I simplify like this? Because now I don't have to choose too many things. So you can make whatever kit you like, but this kit is simple enough that I don't have 
a lot of thought about which burr I'm going to use today. And it forces me to be very rigorous uh, in having the same, following the same routine every time. Now, the, this routine, I train my students. I train them in courses. I train them uh, live. I train them on patients uh, and with documentation. So we train it. So we'll go through some of uh, the steps that I train people in. And then I'm going to go through some cases to show that, you know, it's just a boring routine. So, so if we start with a quadrant, <clears throat> The first step for me is always occlusal reduction. Now, I don't do depth cuts. This is a great argument that I've had a lot of people. I had someone recently tell me that they taught at a dental school for many years and that at dental schools they use depth cuts and therefore depth cuts are good. Now, I would argue that given that most dental students graduate from dental school with extremely poor skills at doing crown preps, that maybe that's not a, support, uh, a supportive argument at all. Now, I have trained actually dental students who have never done crown preps at all. So I've had, I get quite a few come and visit my office. And so uh, just to give you a little example, I got a dental student who had never done a crown prep, sat them down on one of our simulation kits and made her start prepping crowns repetitively again and again and again. And Without crown prep, she was able to start producing really nice crowns. Uh, sorry, without depth cuts, she was able to start producing really nice crowns in a very short period of time. And she said when she went back to dental school, uh, everyone else would be doing one crown for four hours and she would just sit there and prep as many teeth as she could. So <clears throat> we don't need to dumb the procedure down just because someone is inexperienced. That's kind of like saying, we're going to teach you to play the piano with only one finger until you're really good, and then we'll bring in the other nine fingers. That's not how it works. You actually have to train someone pretty much from the beginning using almost their entire hand, uh, and then you just make that better and better. And so I think trying to make the procedure dumbed down because someone new is inexperienced is just not a sensible way to train people. So for me, we don't do depth cuts pretty much on anything except veneer preps. So the way we do this is that you sink the burr on one end of a quadrant. If you're doing a quadrant, you sink the burr to the depth that you require. So if you need two millimeters of reduction, you get a two millimeter burr and you sink the burr until it's flush with the top of the tooth, which is what you do to do a depth cut. But instead of taking it out and doing another depth cut, you hold the burr at that level and then you just slowly drive along which if it's a tooth, the entire tooth. If it is a quadrant, you do the entire quadrant. If it's front teeth, you do six front teeth. So you can do uh, incisal reduction of six front teeth in about a minute. You just drive from one tooth all the way along. Uh, <clears throat> now, what does this do? To be able to do this, you have to have the feel of the maximum rate that a diamond burr can munch through tooth. You can't push diamond burrs too hard because they actually have a maximum rate. And if you push them harder than that, they start coming out of the tooth. And so the movement is actually not that fast. So you hold the burr there and you're moving it forward, controlling the depth. And you will feel the limit when the burr starts to lift out of the tooth. Now, this takes practice. That's why we have plastic teeth. Uh, and what you're trying to do is not prep the tooth 50 times. You're trying to prep the tooth once. So mostly, particularly when people are using air turbines, they prep the tooth about 50 times. So you'll see them going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And that process of going backwards and forwards uh, is to shave the tooth down bit by bit. And the effect of that is that you are prepping the tooth 10, 20, 30, 40 times. So what I'm kind of trying to train my students to do is do the prep once as fast as possible, but it's better to prep the tooth slightly slower and only do it once than to prep it quickly and 50 times. So you sink the burr in and then you drive the burr to the other end of the tooth or you drive the burr to the other end of the quadrant. 
And then obviously you flip the handpiece over and you do the other side. <clears throat> so once you have done that, and I do the secondary planes as well. So, you know, I'm just gonna run along the tooth, take out both planes. And then if there is uh, context, I'm gonna break the contacts. It just makes it easier to see where the margin of the tooth is. And then of course, if there's old restorations, I'm going to remove all of the old cores. I'm going to dismantle everything. Uh, <clears throat> now, I don't generally go around the tooth and do any sort of axial prep until I have done occlusal reduction and until I have uh, re dismantled and removed all of the old restorations. And the reason for that is it's the minimum number of preps. If you prep the entire crown prep, right down to the gingiva, all the way around axial, occlusal, and then you do a core buildup, you now have to prep the entire crown prep again. But if you just do occlusal reduction, take out any restorations, then do a buildup, the only bit that you have to repeat is the occlusal reduction. And it stops you using as much core buildup material because any remaining structure that's there doesn't need to be core built up. And so then you go from there and you finish your occlusal reduction and you drive around the tooth axially and you uh, do the, the remainder of the prep. So that, that is the most efficient way. So uh, obviously these preps had previous crown preps done already. So it's more of a fix up. Uh, and it's one of the exercises I do, which is to get people to build preps and destroy them and then make them again. So core build ups and then the final. So now, if you do this enough, you should be able to do a prep that looks like this. So a very fine prep, which is very difficult to do in about 20 minutes. Uh, actually, most students can do that in about, in about uh, 10. Now this order, this list is for some reason. I think it's, this, is, this is part of our fun live CNTV. We have a question I wanna share at this moment because I know there'll be great questions. It's sure. really helpful slash necessary to write them and the, put your questions in the Q&A because we don't always see them when they're in the chat. The chat is like a river filled with nachos flying by. So put them in the Q&A. But for this nice dentist, I will ask Link, what would be the benefit of doing the core buildup after the occlusal re reduction? Why would you not want to do it first? So if you just prep everything out and then uh, do the core buildup, uh, then you will get, first of all, you have more shrinkage issues because you now have a much deeper cavity. The second thing is you have to use a lot more core buildup material because you have to fill up. That last bit of the occlusal portion is about five times the volume of the mesial and distal boxes. The third reason is that you get significant C factor issues if you have the entire cavity. So, uh, when you've cut the top off a tooth and you've taken out all of the mesial and distal amalgams, then the uh, uh, prep is usually quite open. And so it really only has one or two walls. And so the, the C factor or the shrinkage issues are basically non-existent. But if you have the entire cavity still present and you fill it with a shrinking material, which all composite resins shrink, now you have maybe a four or a five walled cavity so you now start to have significant c factor issues and you now have to layer your composites to try and avoid that now i just bulk cure my composites because i've already done the occlusal reduction and so there's no c factor issues so you, you can either use a self-curing core buildup material or you can use a uh just a regular composite like you can use your regular restorative composites and bulk cure them because one, there's no C factor, and two, because it's quite thin. It's only going to be two millimeters thick at most if you've already cut the top off the tooth. So I've thought a lot about this method. That's why always cut the top off first, then dismantle, control your tissues, then do core buildups, and then do your final prep. So good question. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Like, I'm going to go back to where I am. I'll pop in again, but please put questions in the uh, question Q&A part. Thanks, Link. Now, this list is supposed to be animated and it's not, so I apologize for that. But the five steps that I follow to make crown preps dull, you know, it's like, let's make crown preps dull again, is occlusal reduction, dismantle, tissue control, core buildup, 
and then you cut the occlusal again and then you drive around the rest of the tooth. So that process, and I'm gonna go through some cases with you pretty much to show you how boring it gets, even for complex cases. So let's take this uh, prep here. <clears throat> uh, I can't even remember why we're doing it. I think the patient had pain or sensitivity to biting or something, so they've got a crack or something like this. Uh, and so step one, you can see I've done occlusal reduction. Actually, I haven't even completed it here. You can see that I've placed the burr on the buccal cusps and cut them down. And then I've immediately gone to the lingual cusps at the same angle to do the secondary plane and cut that down before I turn the handpiece over and do the both reverse occlusal reduction. So step one is we just chop the top off the tooth. Now, this is where you need to start getting aggressive, okay? There's a many things in life where if you don't commit to them fully, you're going to fail. And it can be scary to commit. So a good example of this would be, uh, I don't do base jumping, but if you watch someone base jumping, uh, where they jump off the edge of a cliff or they jump off a building, it's extremely important that they throw themselves off the cliff or the building with enthusiasm. Because mostly on those types of situations, there's something down about five meters if they don't jump clear of it, they're going to hit it and then they're going to go unconscious and then they'll die. So <clears throat> now one of the things in dentistry that is like this is tissue. Tissue needs to be treated aggressively because if you don't treat soft tissues aggressively, they just bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. So I'm going to go through some little tips with this. So when you are prepping caries out of a crown prep, pay no attention to the tissue. If you have to cut that tissue because you're getting the caries off, cut the tissue. In fact, it's better to cut tissue if you want it to stop bleeding because that tissue where there's caries is inflamed and inflamed tissue bleeds really, really well. And so if you cut the tissue back, it will actually be easier to stop it bleeding than if you don't. So this is difficult when you're a new dentist because you're always terrified of hitting the tissue or hitting the bone or who knows what. So prep aggressively get the caries out if you cut the tissue you cut the tissue don't worry you won't feel a thing patient might but you won't this is why i'm also anesthetizing both the buckle and the palate or the buckle and the lingual of all teeth is because i want to be able to cut the tissues it's not so much for the tooth it's for the tissues so that i can cut them if you've got a laser you can burn them if you've got electricity whatever you want to do but you want to be able to do that aggressively now I'm a simple man, so I don't have any fancy material. So here I've used Teflon as a retraction cord. So just look at, here we go, blood bath. Now, and the second thing about caries is we're taught at dental school that if you get a pulp exposure, you're a bad, bad person and you should be failed. And that's just ridiculous. If you get a pulp exposure, mostly it's because the tooth has a pulp exposure. Uh, <clears throat> sure, there might be some teeth where some people could have avoided it and you couldn't. But the reality is you didn't cause the disease. So it's like, imagine every on oncologist failed wherever a patient dies of cancer. It's like it's the oncologist's fault that the patient has cancer. And that's just not true. It's not your fault that the patient turned up with a massive disease in their tooth. You're trying to fix it. So remove caries. And if you hit the pulp, don't cry and stay awake all night. And, you know, like most of you, you're going to try and avoid it. This whole idea that you get marked down for pulp exposure is just stupid. I think I, I know we talk a lot about communication because I always just say you just need a root filling now. Don't even call it a root canal. You just need a root filling. That's my uh, my line. But there's a couple more questions. What do you recommend <clears throat> to cut the tissue? Scalpel, burr, laser? Okay, it depends how rich you are. If you're poor like me, well, not really, but you know, I just use a burr. I'm just too lazy to have all sorts of fancy kit. I just use a diamond burr. Um, if you, if you want like the cheapest electro surge you can get, use a fine diamond burr with the water turned off and it will cut the tissue and cauterize it as well. And then in this picture here, you can see that I've got cotton wool, which has been soaked in viscostat. And if you stuff that into the tissue and wait about four minutes, it will stop bleeding. Nice. I stop like that. Bleeding. One more. When you cut across the top at the horizontal cut, are you copying the original anatomy or just flat top? No, copy the anatomy as best you can. Otherwise, you'll end up with over-reduction of your cusps and under-reduction of the fissure. 
So you angle the burr and you just follow the anatomy. Thanks, Link. Yeah, and so here I've used uh, Teflon. So I rolled up Teflon. I actually roll it up softly. Don't roll it too tight. Packed it into the tissue. You have to have anesthesia for this, obviously, because packing Teflon is very aggressive. You have to pack it hard, otherwise it doesn't stay in. Uh, all the way around. And then cotton. This is just cotton pulled out of a cotton roll, soaked in Viscostat clear. So not regular Viscostat, because that makes everything go brown. Viscostat clear. And you pack it into the tissues like retraction cord. So it's not gentle. None of this is gentle. Patient can't feel it because they're numb. Uh, this is five minutes later. Okay, so you can see that that <clears throat> tissue is dry as can be, and I'm able to put a core build up and finish prepping. And then when I want to take a scan, I place a thick cord. Now, this is where we get into those things. It's often better to take a little bit more time to do something once than to try and cut corners and then risk doing it many times. So mostly at dental school, we're taught to use, this is one good thing we are taught at dental school, which is to use multiple cords, like a thick cord, and then leave it and then take it out. And so, uh, but often when people graduate, they quit doing that because I don't know why. And then from thereafter, impressions are a struggle. So in this case, we've got Teflon in already. Uh, we've placed a core, finished the prep. Tissue, as you can see, is now beautiful, even though I have, on that mesial side of the tooth, I have cut that tissue quite aggressively. Uh, <clears throat> place thick cord. The trick with thick cord, this is once again those things where you need to hurry up and wait. So I've placed the cord. Cord doesn't work unless you leave it in place for about three to five minutes. So if you place cord and then you immediately pull it out, you've just created a bleeding. So replace the thick cord, set a timer for five minutes and go and do it. If you've got a, like 10 hygiene rooms, go and do a hygiene check. Or if you don't, uh, go and play on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is to, that you do. So, you know, social media is very important to clinical excellence because it keeps dentists involved when they need to be waiting. And then we take a scan or an impression and so on. And because we've followed those steps of a mindless routine, we get a great scan first time or a great impression first time. And if you get all of those things, then you can easily go into, you know, getting a design. So in this case, I used the CEREC and the design was automatic. It took literally one minute to get the design because everything was nice. And so the software could just do its thing. <clears throat> so let's go into something a little bit more scary that you will see that it is the same boring routine. So these two teeth, I know are uh, quite heavily filled and they're, you know, I can look at the x-ray and go, I think these teeth are going to potentially be subgingival, but I'm not 100% sure. Now, one of the things you can do in some cases to remove distractions is place a rubber dam. So in this particular case, I put a rubber dam on because I wasn't sure what I would find and it's quicker in many cases to prep everything out under rubber dam. Unfortunately, once I started prepping the teeth, I realized there wasn't enough structure to hold a rubber dam on and I was going to have to go back to old school tissue control. So both of these restorations were subgingival in a number of areas and it was an absolute bloodbath once I finished the prep. Never fear, uh, I know that I can control the tissue and I can control it if I'm calm and I go through step by step. So the first thing is I placed, in this case, thin retraction cord soaked in Viscostat. I decided that wasn't going to be enough. So then I placed Teflon as well. Now what Teflon does that most cords don't is it compresses tissue. And when you compress the gingiva, it shuts down the blood flow. And then it was still bleeding like crazy. So then I pulled cotton out of the cotton roll, soaked it in Viscostat clear and packed it all around. And I went away for five minutes and I came back and the tissue was now under control. So there's still clots on the tooth here. So you can see on the mesial of that first molar, there's a blood clot that has to be scrubbed off. But now we have control of the tissues, even though it's quite a difficult case. Now, <clears throat> where it's very easy to make mistakes is when you panic. So you look at a case like this and it's bleeding everywhere and then it's easy to get panicked and then you start making poor choices. And the choice you make is to do too much. So 
An example of that is you place cord and then it's still bleeding and then you push the cord in and you pull it out again and it's still bleeding and then you pack a bigger cord and then you keep doing things. Now, most bleeding will actually just stop on its own if you wait 10 minutes. So if it's an absolute, like just monstrous blood path, sometimes all you've got to do is walk out of the room, go and do something else for a few minutes, come back. And when you come back, it stops bleeding because we have a whole bunch of clotting factors and, and uh, all the little arterioles will shut down. You get all the clotting factors happening. And so the bleeding will start to slow down just of its own if you wait a bit. Now, obviously it is helpful if you recognize a really difficult case to book a little bit longer in your appointment so that you are not stressing. <clears throat> uh, now, from this case, then I've just gone straight to core buildups. Obviously, I mean, there was cotton rolls and all sorts of things when I placed it. Uh, I couldn't use rubber dam because both of these preps actually have a few margins that are subgingival. And to place a rubber dam on these teeth is possible, but it would take about half an hour. And so I wasn't going to do that for these particular teeth. And then you can see, ready for the impression, I've placed that thick cord again, and we're going to wait five minutes. And now what was seemingly two very difficult preps with a lot of bleeding is now just routine dentistry. <clears throat> now, even when we go into bigger cases, it's exactly the same thing. So there's no difference between a full arch prep and a single crown. It's just, if you are prepping a single crown, you just do a clusal reduction of one tooth. If you're prepping an entire arch, then you may do a clusal reduction of the entire arch with a few little caveats that I'm not going to get into today. Now, one thing you can do to make your preps easy is if they've got major problems, fix them first. So in this particular case, there was, there's no way that you can do a crown prep on these teeth that have really thin tissues and have it easy. In fact, doing thin tissues like those lower left premolars uh, is a very good place to get surgical emphysema. So I have never got surgical emphysema from doing surgery, but I have had at least three cases of surgical emphysema from doing crown preps on lower premolars, where the tissue is just so thin that the compressed air from the drill just blows under the tissue, usually after you've placed retraction cord, because you put the cord in and you break that last little bit of tissue connection and the air just blows in under the tissue and uh, pumps the tissue up. And then obviously you need to put the patient on antibiotics and so on. so on. So in this particular case, I've had, we did soft tissue grafting and all sorts of things, but if you don't do those sorts of things, just refer it to a periodontist and get them to fix all the tissues first. <clears throat> so notice it's going to be the same thing. So step one is I've done a clusal reduction from canine to canine, all the way across. I've done it all in one cut. Number two, I have dismantled. So I've taken out all of the restorations. So you can see uh, there's restorations there. And <clears throat> frequently I find, particularly new graduates are afraid to remove old restorations. Uh, part of it is they're afraid when they go through the restoration, they're going to cause a pulp exposure. You know, I mean, the trick with not getting pulp exposures is use a big burr. The larger diameter burr is much less likely to cause a pulp exposure than a small diameter because you have to push much, much harder to accidentally penetrate through the dentine into the pulp. Uh, <clears throat> just cut it out aggressively. And so and it's frequently I find, particularly with less experienced dentists, they're actually afraid to remove tooth and remove prep because I don't know. I don't know what happens. Maybe Paul can tell me. I think they get filled with guilt. It's like it's your fault that the patient has caries and it's your fault that they have occlusal reduction and it's your that fault that they need secret. procedures. Enamel is the most sacred thing on planet Earth. The non-restored tooth link is a thing of majestic beauty. It's so majestical, as my children would say. Since I stopped in for a joke here, let me ask you one more question while we're here. You're going to have a lot at the end. So if you, if you go long enough, I can miss the battle for bedtime and just get to the good part. So don't, don't worry about me. Um, ah. What, is there a benefit to using Teflon instead of retraction cord soaked in hemodent at the beginning of the prep? Yes, <clears throat> but it's like any procedure. Uh, I would say it's horses for courses. So Teflon is good for compression of tissues. So retraction with Teflon is aggressive. So 
you know, it is very close to doing a gingivectomy in aggressiveness. And in fact, if you use Teflon in really thin tissues, you will cause a gingivectomy as a side effect. So where you want massive retraction and compression of tissues, then use Teflon. If you have nasty, nasty, mucky, inflamed strawberry jelly tissue uh, or raspberry jelly or whatever sort of jelly that you have, if you have tissue that's like that, just nasty, bleeding, disgusting, inflamed tissue, you're actually better just to cut it back first before you try any type of cords. Um, it, it, this, this is only something I've discovered in the last 12 months is that when you have inflamed tissue, particularly interproximal, you get a better hemostasis if you cut it back aggressively to clean, healthy, bleeding tissue than if you try and be gentle with it. So Teflon, uh, when you want massive retraction, massive compression of the tissues. If you, if you are really concerned, you can place thin cord with Viscostat clear first, then put Teflon over the top. But if you leave that in place for an hour, you're going to get massive inflammation and necrosis of the tissues like it, it doesn't necessarily cause recession but the tissue will look all burnt in about two days time because most uh, astringents or hemostatic agents are not designed to be packed into the tissue for an hour or two hours so uh, the good thing about teflon is it doesn't have any hemostatic agents so it doesn't cause uh it doesn't cause any risk of necrosis if you leave it there for a long time so no uh, soaking the tap on and anything just soaking up <laughs> You can't happen. soak Teflon because Teflon is impermeable to water or liquids. Um, the good thing about Teflon is that no, no <laughs> fluid comes through it. So if you place cord, the cord can get wet and the water can go through the cord and then onto the prep. If you place Teflon, the Teflon is waterproof. One more before I let's get back on it because I always love the sure. words in dentistry to just make our patients feel so weird on the inside when you shout out. Do you want to have impregnated or non-impregnated cord was one of the questions. Do you want your cord to be impregnated? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, there's nothing better than fertile cord. No, I think it's a silly, <laughs> silly word. Um, I actually just use plain cord and then I soak it in Viscostat clear. If So my assistant asked me, do you want it soaked or not? And if I want it soaked, she dips it in a Dappen's dish of Viscostat clear and then you have to dry it off so that it's only just enough. Because if it's all like got viscostat clear gel all over the cord it, it's hard to handle and it's hard to pack it gets on your gloves and makes them slippery and also that stuff tastes terrible aluminium chloride is not tasty so well it is tasty but bad tasty it's nasty tasty perfect back to your show link going great really enjoying it why doesn't nasty and tasty rhyme that's funny anyway um so here we have assertively let's not use the word aggressive it's negative we have assertively removed all of the old dental work all right and then i've used corbelups i use paracore from coltine i don't care what you use you can use good flowable composite you can use your regular paste composite that you, that you have for front teeth you can use core paste uh, if you follow bill strap i don't really care um I use Paracor because I can get it here and because it comes in a nice little syringy thing uh, and I can just inject it and do it. Now, I don't use it for single teeth. Single teeth, it's better just to use your regular composite because you can set it quickly. But when you are doing a whole set of teeth like this, it's quicker to use a core material because you can just easily inject it on all six teeth and let it set. So you can see cores, okay, then preps. So it is just a mindless routine cut the top off, dismantle, do core buildups, do the rest of the prep. Okay, what if you get a pulp exposure? Well, here I found one. I cut everything out. <clears throat> first of all, I took a photo because you can see there's a crack in the first molar. And I need that photo because in five or seven years time, when the patient gets a toothache and I have to extract the tooth and do an implant, even though she's had a full mouth rehabilitation, I can say, look, your tooth has a crack. <clears throat> The second tooth here has a pulp exposure. Now, this pulp exposure was done years and years and years ago and then covered, and uh, the patient has had no pain ever since, but I've discovered it during my prep. Now, I'm glad I discovered that. Imagine if I'd left this old restoration in place and hadn't discovered it, and then the patient gets a toothache, and now it's my fault, whereas here I've got absolute proof 
that this patient had a pulp exposure before they ever saw me. Uh, and interestingly, when you go back and look at the cone beam, I can now see that there's periagical pathology on the mesiobuccal root. So in this case, now the patient was sedated when I was doing this because it was a full arch. And so when she woke up at another visit, I've explained to her, this is what's happened. There's a problem there from the last dentist years and maybe 30 years ago, and she needs root canal therapy. Not my fault. <clears throat> I have zero regrets. And then you can see I've done cores and I placed cord. Notice mindless routine. Okay, same again, pre-op cut the occlusal down, take everything out, even though it's scary, just take everything out. Now, these are quite deep subgingival on the buckle here. You can see that I'm down in the tissues and I've had to pack, in this case, I've used thick cord soaked in viscostat just to get the tissue out of the way so I can see what I'm doing and so that I can cut. But look how little bleeding is occurring. This takes five minutes. I would have packed the cotton wool as well and waited five minutes. Core buildups and then preps, front teeth. Okay, it's the same thing over and over again. Cut the top of the tooth, dismantle, control your tissues, take time to control your tissues. <clears throat> Don't try and rush. When you rush, you will end up taking longer. And then core build-ups, prep, and then put your cords in, okay? And then of course, if you ever are in a situation where you, um, run out of time or it's too stressful or the tissue. I have had some patients where the tissue I just can't control. Uh, usually it's the patients who take Xarelto or the other novel anti-hemostatic things. Uh, then I just put temporaries on and come back another day. Now, yes, it ruins your production, but it doesn't ruin your production as much as trying to take the same impression nine times running late uh, and your impression's still rubbish. And then, you know, you get a crown back that doesn't fit and then you have to start again. So in some cases, it is more profitable to take a hit on the day of the prep, put a temporary on, get the patient back when the tissues are healed and turn something super stressful and difficult and poor quality into something that is easier. <clears throat> Uh, and then same with impressions, you know, you have all of your cords. And so quite commonly, the big issue that happens is that instead of taking the time to do each step properly, we end up trying to, uh, hang on, I'm just going to stop this share. <clears throat> we end up trying to rush steps to make it quicker. And in the process of rushing each step, we make the next step more difficult. I'll give you a little example. When I built my house, the brick layer was, there's two rows of bricks around the base of my house because I live on a, a farm with uh, red volcanic soil and the red soil stains everything. So if you build a normal house, you get a red stain up the base of the house. And so uh, <clears throat> we have bricks up for about a foot on the base of the house and then there's wood above that. Uh, and when they were building those bricks, he was being so careful. I said, why, why is it so careful? Like this, these bricks are not even structural. They're just there for looks. And he said, if I don't get these straight, then it makes it more difficult for the carpenter to put the, the siding on the house because now he's trying to fix the siding to crooked bricks. And then that makes it more difficult to put the windows in because now they're trying to put windows in to siding that's crooked because the bricks are crooked and, and so on and so on and right to the very final layer. And so each thing that wasn't done right compounds with the next step. So if we go back to our start, number one practice. So get some plastic teeth out or join a class or get, you know, your mother-in-law, typical place to start practicing uh, unless you like her. Um, uh, anyway, and so get some practice in, so drill. Do things repetitively, particularly on plastic teeth, because then it doesn't matter. Like I'm, I prefer my students to destroy some teeth, make a complete mess of it, but still do each prep in a realistic time zone or time frame. Number two, get rid of all the distractions in your life. Get rid of the staff who come and ask questions. Well, don't get rid of them. Okay, I'm not like saying you put them in a wood chipper like Breaking Bad or something like this. I'm just saying you know, train people not to distract you and get rid of as many distractions. Look around your office. What can I do to remove distractions while I'm doing procedures? And then three, make it dull. Just do the same thing again and again and again. And when you're doing it, I think the best way to think of it is like boxes. 
So imagine you have seven boxes in a row and each side, each one has a small procedure inside. So the first box has local anesthetic. The second box has occlusal reduction. The third box has dismantle. The fourth box has tissue control. The fifth box has uh, call buildups and the sixth box is finish the prep and then take an impression. And so what you wanna think about is you're not allowed to open the box more than once. And so where things get difficult is when you start to do a prep or something like this, quite often you think about all of the, you wanna open all six boxes at the same time and pull everything out and, and think about it all at once. And it's just a mess. So shut off everything else and just go, all I need to do is local anesthetic perfectly, profoundly, deeply. And then the next thing, once you've done that, so don't try and cheap out and go, oh, maybe I only need one capsule. I always give them two or three, it's cheap. Smash them with anesthetic. You go, oh, but they, they might complain about the numbness afterwards, who cares? You're a surgeon, you're meant to make people numb and cause them discomfort afterwards, that's your job. <clears throat> Number two, occlusal reduction, that's all you think about. You don't think about what comes next, that's all you think about. And then number three, dismantle. You're not worried about the tissue. Don't think about the tissue. Don't think about how hard the core build up. Don't think about root canal therapy. Don't think about anything except I have to get everything out of this tooth. Put your blinkers on. Don't think about all the other stuff. It's distracting. You can't do two things at once, so just do one. And then once you have completely removed caries and everything, then close that box, put it away. Don't open it again. Next box is tissue control. And don't think about, oh, I'm running late and I've got to do my core build up and if I don't hurry. Okay, just open the box, do tissue control, take five minutes, take six minutes, take 10 minutes if you have to. It's better to take 10 minutes and get that tissue controlled properly than to be fighting it for the rest of the appointment. Close the box and put it away. Open your next box. Now it's core build ups. Don't think about anything else, just do that. And so each, now you're breaking the procedure and everything's easy and simple and your brain power is focused on little tiny tasks instead of getting distracted. Okay. And that is how you make crown preps fast, precise and easy. Amazing Go job, Link. Uh, thanks for doing this uh, to start your day. We're gonna take a few questions from our audience here. If you have a few extra minutes for us uh, and I wanna talk about a few other things, let's go through a few questions if you don't mind. Um, oh, far away. Do we have to remove uncarious composite fillings? If so, what's the reason? Some of these may be reconfirming what you said, but I just didn't want to interrupt. That's a good question, that one. Uh, if you placed it in the last few years and you're confident that it's good, then don't replace it. If you didn't do it, I would suggest that you cut it out because you don't know what you will find under there. So uh, now when I was younger and less experienced, I didn't like removing composite because I couldn't tell the difference between composite and tooth. And I was terrified of doing a pulp exposure, which would give me a failing grade, even though I'd already left dental school. And so <clears throat> uh, that was the main reason I tried to avoid it. And also I used to just be so like, I would like tickle the tooth, you know, like, and then I'd have a look. Uh, but so far in my experience, I have not been able to prep a tooth with the force or my mind, only when the burr is on the tooth. Good, great, good answer. Thanks. Like, I, I like those sound effects too. You should make your own, own sound effects thing for your choice. After the core buildup, when you prep and refine the margins again, especially in the inner proximal, how do you present yourself from causing a bleeding again? Or do you not care since you're I don't care. afterwards? I don't care. Like mostly you are going to cause bleeding again, but you're going to pack cord again anyway. I mean, the thing is, if you're doing a deep, just accept the fact that if it's a deep subgingival restoration, it's going to be more difficult. So don't book the same amount of time have a look at what you're going to do. And then, you know, if this is a difficult case, now the difficulty is that as an experienced dentist, I can actually tell which cases are difficult and which ones are not. But when you're inexperienced, you can't tell the difference. So that is one of those difficult parts of being inexperienced. But try and look for things like, uh, how close is the old restoration to the bone? If it's close, it's gonna be difficult. How big is the pulp? If the pulp is big, your risk of pulp exposure could be high. But if the pulp is non-existent, you could prep the tooth like a crazy person and you're never going to expose the pulp. Like I've seen lower incisors where the pulp is flush with the bone 
So literally I could prep down to bone level before I do a pulp exposure. So it's not random. Uh, it's not a random thing that happens. I like that link. Good one. Uh, what's your opinion on biomimetic overlay preps instead of doing core buildups and crown preps? So we need to, people ask me about biomimetic dentistry all the time. Uh, the thing about biomimetic dentistry is that most people who teach it teach excellence and I'm all on board with excellence. Uh, <clears throat> Biomimetic, the word biomimetic itself is a marketing term. Uh, it's a term that's been made up. It's a philosophy. It's not really a scientific term. It's a philosophy. And so uh, I have nothing against biomimetic restorative dentistry. Um, much of it doesn't have outcome-based evidence, as in we know that if you do things this way, it gives a better long-term outcome to the patient than if you do it in a traditional way. I do onlays wherever I can, because they're easy. But if you look at the cases I showed today, most of those cases are too difficult for onlays. They're impossible. Like you've got 270 degrees of uh, subgingival margin from the previous amalgam. It's just not a great place to do a bonded onlay. And I have done bonded onlays since 2004, because that's when I got my first CEREC. So my experience has been that uh, when you, most of the cases where you can do onlays are actually easy cases. When a case is really, really, like when you're doing a crown, it's usually because the case, the tooth is really badly damaged and it's very, very difficult. And so this variation in the patient that we're presented with is not usually accounted for when people argue about procedures. Now, keep in mind that of the three things that affect outcome the most, number three is the procedure you choose. Number two is how excellent you are as a dentist, regardless of procedure chosen. And number one is obviously the health and quality of the patient. So the quality of work you do far outweighs the procedure that you choose to do, but everyone likes to focus on the procedure, not on the quality of the dentist. And it's actually easier to teach procedures than to teach skills. Like my whole business is focused on teaching dentists to have the skill that they can do anything with excellence. That is much more difficult than just teaching you the theoretical knowledge of a procedure. Love that link. We'll do one more, then we'll chat about some fun stuff here. Mm -hmm. and we'll, we've hit enough time for the CE credit. In the chat, it shares how you can text in to get it. My amazing team member, Christian, will also put the actual code in there. This is not my first rodeo. If this was a real rodeo, it would be my first rodeo, but I've done hundreds of CE hours on Zoom for Dental Nachos. I know there's questions about how the CE works, so you can email CE at dentalnachos.com. As we finish up the CE here, I just wanted, last question, Link, got to got, understand about the uh, Teflon. Um, does Viscostat Clear have any chance of causing any debonding issues if it's not cleaned properly? I mean, if it's not cleaned properly, then absolutely. So um, just just actually one other thing, Paul, like I'm happy sure. to answer questions for longer if anyone okay, wants cool. to. Okay, cool, yeah, yeah, we'll still um, answer them. I just want to give no, the seat. Questions are easy for me. I've got to the break of midnight here in the US. Okay, but <clears throat> going back to Viscostat Clear. So Viscostat Clear doesn't really affect bonding unless you leave it on the tooth. So wash it off, obviously. Um, if you use plain Viscostat, regular Viscostat, then it will make everything go brown because it's ferric sulfate instead of aluminium chloride. So uh, don't use don't use regular uh, like hemostatic agents that are brown because they make your things go brown and I don't like brownness. I mean, a lot of people ask about my core buildup material because it's white, and I think the main reason they're interested is because it looks nice and pretty in pictures, which is also why I use it. Like I don't use it because it's you know majestically better than regular core buildup materials. Just that if you use a core buildup material, it's slightly translucent. It looks terrible on social media. So uh, yeah. it's important, know. right? The social media pics. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to give them, make sure you, uh, to get the link to, for this CE code, and we'll put this here. Mm -hmm. Text link to 215. Okay, next question. For teeth without abfractions, how do you fill the abfraction? Do you fill the abfraction first or just include it in the prep without a filling? Both. Gotcha. So okay. if I'm doing, uh, if there's abfractions and I'm doing a crown, then I'm going to uh, fill the abfraction as part of the core buildup. 
and then and, and you have to prep the abfraction so you can't stick things to you know old stagnant dentine that's been exposed to the mouth for ages you have to prep that with a diamond burr cut it all back fresh and then you include that in your core buildup. I mean, and then uh you, i prep my margin down to the tooth so uh there are some people who like to do uh composite at the margin and then finish their ceramics on the composite i'm not comfortable with this uh, I have tried it in the past. Uh, what I have found is that a lot of things are good in theory. Um, some things are not as good in real life. So sometimes the teeth that I treat haven't read the literature. And so uh, they don't realize what they're supposed to do. Um, great one. Uh, next one here, Link. Thanks. We're not going to do too many more. I'm going to share a few fun things. I want to ask Link about his practice for a few minutes too. After removing old restorations and doing a occlusal reduction, do you rough prep the rest of the tooth before the retraction cord and refine? Yeah, yes. So you better to prep everything before you, most of the time, okay? Because I'm experienced, I can look at the tooth and I know when to vary my standard procedure. And I can't teach that because that can only come through a lot of experience. But in general, I'm going to cut occlusal reduction. So what happens when I place thin cord before finishing the prep, I get a thing called helicoptering, which is when the burr wraps up in the retraction cord and it frightens the life out of everyone in the room and they all have to go and change their underbit. Okay, and so <clears throat> it's nearly as bad as when you get rubber dam stuck in the burr. Okay, or the patient's tongue. Uh, not that the tongue usually helicopters, but it can be exciting <laughs> when you, you know, they stuck their tongue in the bear and you go, oh. So <clears throat> I find that you can't put cord in. You can put Teflon in and prep because Teflon you can prep onto it and it won't helicopter. But if you put cord in while you're still prepping, you often get a helicopter arrangement and that's just no fun for anyone. And then you also have to get it off your burr, which is quite difficult. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I usually prep. I want to interject when, uh, Link, because some people, most people are here in the beginning, but we talked about Ripe Global. I'm putting in the chat the link to join. There's six spots left for your next Crown Prep Bootcamp link on May 21st. Mm -hmm. And you it. can do that from anywhere on earth. You just need compressed air, a plate of nachos, and what else? Uh, well, I mean, we've even had people have a margarita whilst doing it, but yeah. you know, I don't encourage that because it's not something you can replicate when you're doing actual patients. So, uh, <clears throat> so you need electricity and compressed air and then you can, and internet. Technically, if you had Starlink and a scuba tank, you could, and a solar panel, I guess, you could join from the middle of the desert if you wanted to, but. Uh, so that's in the <laughs> chat right now. There's CE questions, <clears throat> CE at dentalnachos.com. If you are here on Zoom the entire time, my team will help you tomorrow. Please be kind and ask them since it's free CE, you can't complain about free. Uh, but our team will help you tomorrow. Just email C at dentalnachos.com. If you don't know how it works, they'll check your hair on Zoom and do that. Link, how about the feral effect on broken down, feral considerations for cases where dismantling leaves little to structure? So you've got to dismantle whether there's too structure or not. So, <clears throat> so this is where, see, when you're dismantling, you're not thinking about feral because that is a later box that you're not opened yet. And so if you start thinking about that, then you're going to get hesitant about cutting away what you need to cut away because you're worried about the next step. And this is where particularly younger dentists get hesitation, <clears throat> which doesn't change the outcome one bit, but it does change how much stress and time it takes them. So when you're dismantling, you don't care about feral. Like Once that. you have finished dismantling and you have the tissue under control, now you can look at feral and if there's not enough now you can sit there and go is this tooth restorable it might not be sometimes you plan to restore a tooth and you take everything out you look at it and go there's no way and so then you can either <clears throat> place a core build up and a temporary so if the patient is sedated and you can't ask for consent then you would place a core build up and a provisional restoration and get them back another day to discuss an extraction and a graft and an implant okay or a root canal therapy if they are awake and you can discuss it you would take a photo sit them up and go look here's your tooth it's going to cost several thousand dollars to fix and then it's not going to last because there's nothing left of the stump 
I would suggest that you get the tooth removed and I graft the socket right now while you're already anesthetized so that because there's just no ability to get a long lasting out of this tooth. Unfortunately, it's too bad the damage. So <clears throat> now, unfortunately, you sometimes don't know this until you cut everything out. So you have to actually do investigative surgery to find yeah. out. So on some complex cases, I book the patient in and I dismantle everything and I do provisionals. That's just my first step. And the reason for that is purely to see whether I can fix the teeth or not. We, I, we, we have a number of dentists working with us. One's a sur surgical prosthodontist who can be like you. So we can go from dismantling to extraction and in, in mm. you know, just a quick switch. We just say it's a, it's a just find mm. out visit. We have a, a fee for it. If we don't do something that's definitive, but if we maintain the tooth or remove it, they do that. Great. I want to share, I actually have a good question link. I don't know. I know we talked about this when you're here. So in the U S we have PPO insurances that are paying us less for the same work. So we actually have a great webinar. This is great for associates too, on how you can have, get dental insurances to pay you more from one of our sponsors, text PPO to 215-543-6454. But how does dental insurance work in Australia? Just totally curious. Uh, so you can, be a, you can be a preferred provider here as well if you wish to. So probably most practices are preferred providers. My practice is not. Now, I will preface that by saying that I've had the practice in the same area for 22 years. And the first five years, I earned a lot less than other dentists to build a practice that had no insurance. Sorry, I have insurance. I'm just not a preferred provider. <clears throat> but I think that we can get into the mindset that somewhere else in the world, patients just love paying dentists and there's never this tension over the cost of dentistry. And that's just a myth. It's a myth that we tell ourselves because it's difficult. You know, it is not easy. It's not any easier to say to a patient that they need to pay the full amount out of pocket as compared to uh, your insurance is going to pay, but it's going to limit my ability to do your work. What I have found, <clears throat> and I train quite a few dentists who work in preferred provider practices, both here and in the United States, <clears throat> If you focus on the patient's goal, not everyone, okay? So this doesn't work for everyone. There's a whole bunch of people out there in the world who just need basic dental care, nothing too fancy, and uh, they're not at the stage of life where it's appropriate for them to try and improve their whole mouth. However, when a patient gets to the point where they want to improve things, and often they have been coming to you for five or six years, and now they are ready. <clears throat> Often they will say to you, how much will my insurance cover? And for us as dentists, we can often get challenged by this and think that the question is, if your insurance doesn't cover me, I'm not going to do it. But actually that's not the question at all. They're just going, how much will it cover? And at that point, if it's a big case, like you know, if it's a full mouth rehabilitation, I don't think there's anywhere in the world where a full mouth rehabilitation is covered by insurance to any significant extent. And so in a case like that, you go, it won't cover much at all. I, cover like one. Think, I don't know. I, don't, I we I've done a lot of um, people actually can text insurance to this number, and I have a video training series and also a letter when we shifted status. I just say think of it like a coupon. Uh, we're going to maximize the benefits of your coupon because in the U.S. we don't think coupons pay for everything. So when patients feel like they're using you know a thousand dollars towards a fifteen thousand dollar case, it can be done in a very friendly and non adversarial way. Um, Link, the other question is, you're a practice owner. Um, <clears throat> we talked a lot of things about inside the operatory. We have your boot camp, but we've talked about the business of dentistry, the leadership of dentistry. You talked a lot about distractions. And I just want to remember, like, as a new practice owner, sometimes you feel your whole day is distracted and you can't focus on the dentistry. Any businessy leadership tips you wish you told yourself <laughs> earlier, whether it's how to talk to your team, how to manage finances, just totally curious. Yeah, so that's actually a very complex topic, Paul. Uh, so first of all, I would say if I was to go back to my beginning again, I would pay for coaching. So I've had practice management coaching for about, it was a long time ago now, but I had it for about three or four years. And to keep in mind now that I have two businesses, so I have my dental practice, which dental practices are really easy to run. They are so easy. And then I have another business, which is a capital raising tech education cloud-based startup, which is incredibly, it's 
unbelievably difficult business to build because there's just so many things that have never been done before. Uh, and you know it's intense. And so <clears throat> at the moment, running that business is like coaching for my dental practice. So everything, you know, like the chief strategy officer is always running workshops for the team and he's building team culture and he's working on employment strategies so that we bring people in who fit the team and they fit our culture and they fit this culture of agility and uh, you know rapid pace. And so I'm taking those things that I'm learning as I guess a CEO of a startup tech education business and applying it to my dental practice. So, but most people don't have that. And so you need coaching of some sort. So what you think sometimes kind of like dental dentists think they should know it on their own and coaching will accelerate your success, less stress, and you don't have to go out there and do it all on your own. Well, you're just not trained to do management of people in dentistry, Paul. In fact, worse than that, I would say that the skills for being an excellent clinical dentist are almost the bipolar opposite of what you need to be a good practice owner. So yeah. to be excellent at clinical dentistry, you need to be able to shut down your emotions, tunnel vision on the procedure, avoid all distractions, tune them out and be, you know, like an unemotional machine. None of that is good for managing a team or managing a business. Businesses need emotional connection. You need communication skills. You need to be able to work with teams of people uh, and multiple things kind of crazy. So <clears throat> teams are... Uh, crazy and i think i would encourage anyone who has a business you know to get coaching but also to go if you want to look at some really good stuff on how to manage dental practices better and get your team better go and look at some of the stuff by joe justice on youtube on agile hardware or ad, just joe agile justice, management that's great. Practices. Watch. i'm glad you said that um one of the things we're doing is we're putting together a super dance business boost camp because i don't know what it's like in australia but dso's are taking over more of the market corporate dentistry doesn't mean they're evil doesn't mean that they're terrible but you know we we went to a great restaurant when you came into town a few years ago and if dentistry turns into all olive gardens and tgi fridays that may be a problem so i'm really striving to share the story of private practice do you guys have the same scenario with corporate yeah, and private it's a global thing paul it's not like dentistry i've traveled a lot to a lot of countries i have students on my subscription side, I have like three and a half thousand students who just download stuff in, I forget how many countries, like 50 countries. I work with teachers in, <clears throat> I have like 40 teachers that I work with in about 25 or 30 countries. And I have students on my biggest, most intense courses in 12 countries. So everywhere from Slovakia to, you know, uh, Chicago. So um, <clears throat> the challenges that they have are pretty much the same you know there's a little bit of local character but they're pretty much the same everywhere in the world which is dentistry is expensive to do and it's the one type of healthcare that's almost completely unsubsidized by either the government or by insurance right, yeah really good points well i'm going to play this video in a minute like this was fantastic I'll let you go but are we uh you know are we still get a chance to see you in person in june or or you're, you're still coming uh, i'm working on june i think it might get delayed paul just because the, it's actually quite tricky organizing travel. I'm actually just booking travel to Europe at the moment. And yeah. it's like, we haven't returned to normal with travel at all. Like the flights get canceled and all this sort of stuff. So uh, I will, if I can't I come in June, good. I will let you know for new dates. Cause I'd love to come over there and meet particularly, um, you know, young dentists and students uh, or anyone, but, but, you know, those are the folks who I really want to support the most. Cause at the start of your career, you need, as much help as yeah, you can well, get. We're going to do some really cool in person here and we'll live stream. Well, I so appreciate your time. Before you guys go, we still have over 100 people. I would love as I played this video and we stop linking out our videos. What's one thing you learned from this course? What's one thing you could use tomorrow? What's one thing you could do better? What's one thing that's going to improve your morale? Thanks so much, Link. Enjoy the rest of your day. Just really loved having you here and we're truly grateful. No problem. Thanks for having me. I'll hopefully back soon. Imagine making a $30,000 mistake. 
when buying a dental practice. Imagine not knowing what questions to ask or how to build a team when making the most important decision of your dental life. My name is Dr. Paul Goodman, Dr. Nacho, and I don't have to imagine that because I made those mistakes in 2011. I didn't know what questions to ask when buying a dental practice. I didn't know working with a dual representation broker is nacho nuts. A dual representation broker claims to be able to represent your interest and the interest of the selling dentist at the same time. So if you only listen to this much, just know that working with a dual representation broker can burn your nachos in making the most important decision of your dental life. My goal as Dr. Paul Goodman, Dr. Nacho, is to help you with the four most important decisions you will make in your entire dentisting career, or what I call the circle of dentisting life. Finding your first job, buying your first practice, hiring your first associate, and selling your only practice. Dental school teaches us a lot about the Krebs cycle and how to make a mediocre bite rim, but not enough about our dentisting core. What is our dentisting core? The decisions we make with our mind, the words we say, which are ultra important, our clinical skills, and at the center of it all, our heart, who we look to help and the impact we look to make. Making mistakes in the four biggest decisions of your dentisting career can cause so many problems. And I wanna give you actionable takeaways in each one of those steps. So let's talk about finding your first job. What is some common mistake dentists make is starting too late. Finding your first job should start day one of D1, not applying for that job, finding it. ABC, always be connecting. Meeting people in industry who can help. Who are these people if you're a dental st student? Who should you reach out to? Go to in-person C events. Sit next to dentists that look older than you and meet them. They may not be looking for an associate, but they may have a friend who's also looking. When you go to sign an associate contract, do not sign one without having a dental-focused attorney review it. As Dr. Nacho, founder of a 30,000 member plus Facebook group, I get poignant messages daily from dental associates who did not have anyone review their contract and now they have a problem. Problem getting paid, problem with their restrictive covenant. So get a dental-focused attorney to review your contract. Nothing bad happens. Either the dental-focused attorney says, hey, this contract looks pretty good, let's ask for a few things here, but if we don't get these things, it's still a good contract. Or they say, there's 14 red flags and I haven't gotten to page two of that contract. So that's finding your first job buying your first practice. The mistake I made with, was with us buying a second practice, but we overpaid by at least $30,000, and here's why. Cash flow is so important. So this $300,000 practice was only profiting $100,000. So another actionable takeaway, a good way to value a practice is two times the net profit, one and a half to two times the net profit, not just 70% of collections. So this broker valued it at $215,000 and we just paid it. There were no Facebook groups. There were no podcasts. We didn't have information on this. We just paid the asking price. And I know that we could have paid at least $30,000 less because it was a practice that was in distress. So if, you have, if you're buying a practice that's in distress, the owner is sick, they have to sell quickly. That is an unfortunate life circumstance for the selling dentist, but you as the buyer, that practice doesn't have the same value as one where the owner might be able to stay on afterwards. So buying your first dental practice is so important. As someone who helps dentists sell their dental practices, I meet dentists at the end of their career, and they have often had multiple houses, sometimes multiple spouses, but just one dental practice. So what does that mean? That one dental practice will stick with you through your career. The third thing, hiring your first associate. When to know do you need an associate? Let me tell you the story of my best friend, Todd. Todd didn't know if he needed an associate, but he knew he was very stressed. He was super successful, amazing fee-for-service practice in Center City, Philadelphia, a fantastic dentist and an even better person, but he didn't know how to find an associate and how to incorporate that associate into his practice. I just met with him recently. He hired this associate two years ago, said it was the best decision of his dental career. So what are the five questions you need to ask and be able to answer when hiring an associate? Why am I looking for an associate? Where is the position? How will the associate be compensated? Dental school debt's a lot different from even when I went, so these young dentists have to be compensated enough to pay their debt, pay their rent, pay their food, things like that, learn things. So how, what, where, when, why? Those are the five questions. Where is the job? Why do you need an associate? How will they be compensated? What procedures will the associate do most of the time? And also, what fun things are there to do in the area? Because there's more to life than just dentisting. And as we wrap up, selling your only practice 
It's such a key point in the career of a dentist. Sell your practice and hang up the handpiece. There should be some ceremony where you hang up the handpiece and ride off into the sunset. But you can't do that unless you sell this practice, which is a very complex transaction. Not only do you need a person, you need a person who wants to be, who is a dentist licensed in that state, wanting to live in that area and be able to get financing for your practice. So one of my best pieces of advice, start early. Connect with brokers, ask good questions, connect with accountants, build your team. I'm a huge fan of basketball. My dream was to play in the NBA. That dream didn't come true. But who would be on this starting five? A dental-focused attorney, a dental-focused accountant, a financial coach, a confidant, a personal confidant that you can ask questions to, a bank along the way too. So these are people that you want to put on your practice transition team and meet them early. Developing relationships is key. So it all goes back to developing this dental focus core, this dental core of your mind, your words, your hand skills. At Dental Nachos, what we do is we want to help you make good dental life decisions. Help learn from mistakes that other dentists have made, like me, when I didn't have information on how to value a practice, how to work with brokers, and how to navigate this sometimes nacho nuts dentisting business world. I love helping dentists. Our goal is to connect us more together with these ABCs. Always be connecting, always be caring, no one really likes going to the dentist, so we may as well like each other. I think this is a special time for us all to bond together, and I wanna be part of the solution in making that happen.